I feel hugely honoured to, to be here to be able to carry this out and um, I'm a massive fan of Parker Adams University. Many young people will write to me and ask me where they should go if they want to get out into the agricultural food supply chain and my number one on my list, so even though um, Science House is just up the road, is, is, <laughs> is, is, is here. It rolls off my lips very easily because I visited here a few times and seen the amazing inroads that this college, this now university, has, has made to educate people um, to go out into that agricultural food supply chain, which is an incredibly exciting industry to be in. Wonderful, uh, the Garfield Western Foundation has, has helped support this building, and my word, if I was shown round this university as a prospective student and walked into a room like this, I know I'd work very, very hard to try and achieve the A-levels to get here. Um, what an amazing place to be and an amazing place to visit. So the students that are here, uh, you're very, very fortunate. And uh, let's hope you, you make the most of your time here. So without further ado, um, I don't think I've ever done this before. <laughs> and, uh, I'd like to announce that the Western Building is now open. <laughs> I was born and brought up in the Cotswold Hills and uh, live a very privileged life, really. My dad took on the farm tenancy at home in 1962. And I always wanted to be a farmer. I was pulling my little wellies, chasing them out the door, wanting to be a farmer from the moment I can remember, really. And the Cotswold Hills are a beautiful place to live and work. We have the rolling hills and then the dry stone walls. Um, so if you think of your Derbyshire Bridgestones and your Welsh slates or your Scottish granites, they're you know, a bit dull and dour on a, on, a, on a misty day. But Cotswold limestone seems to be warm all year round. I went off to local schools and then off to agricultural college. I went to Seal Hain, now uh, down in Devon, that's now sadly closed down. Um, Harper Adams was one of our sort of arch rivals at sport, um, and, but lots of friendships made from Harper Adams and Seal Hain. But our college uh, disappeared and closed down. We became part of uh, Polytechnic Southwest and then a university. But Harper Adams has gone, done the opposite, absolutely flown. And now I understand has around 5,000 students, which is just extraordinary, and uh, that's a huge success. <laughs> And then after college, I travelled the world. I did the New Zealand, uh, Australia trip and through the Americas and home and had a great time. But my father, quite cleverly, never sort of forced me into farming. Uh, he just sort of channeled me gently. But he, as I said, it was always something I wanted to do. And so dad went into farming. This is my father, Joe Henson. Uh, so he's my hero, my mentor. Uh, my little footsteps hardly fill his great big ones. And he went into uh, went to Science Hester, then he went on to a farm where he was an assistant manager on, on uh, the Bathurst estate, and then went to Salkerton Park here, here at home, and eventually took on the farm tenancy in 1962. So it was a mixed farm, uh, sheep and arable and, and a suckler herd, but he started collecting old-fashioned breeds of farm animals. So after the war, we were a starving nation, and uh, there was a huge pressure put on the agricultural industry to turn on the tap for food production because we never wanted to have food rations ever again. And so, as we did that, we streamlined agriculture and left many of our old farming fa fashion farming practices behind, and some of our breeds, as many of you will, will know. So things like the Gloucester cattle, quite good at producing beef, quite good at producing milk, but not brilliant at either. They were outclassed by the Frisian or the Holstein, and the continental beef breeds, uh, the, you know, the Limousin, the Charolais, the Belgian Blue, those sorts of breeds. And so they became very, very rare and almost extinct. And Dan went to the final sale and bought some and started to collect them and many other farm animals. His farming mates thought he was nuts. And why are you making this collection? These animals are rare because they're not commercially viable. They don't make any money. And he said it's for a number of reasons. Partly because uh, they're a hobby, like you might collect stamps or British stamps, vintage tractors. Partly because uh, they're part of our living heritage, they're the antiques of the countryside, but most importantly of all, because they're a valuable gene bank for the future of farming. Farming won't always be so streamlined. We need the diversity of farming practices and farming breeds. And now, 40 years on, it's been proven right. Sure, we still need to turn on the tap for food production. We, still, we are still streamlining and, in, and encouraging innovative ways in agriculture, but we need that diversity to suit all the different systems, to suit all the different tastes, to suit the different choices on our supermarket shelves. And it's wonderful that we've still got a lot of our old-fashioned breeds to help do that. And big supermarkets are now wanting named breed, named breed. So Morrisons are asking for beef short on beef. Um, you know, the co-op are asking for Hereford beef, uh, Berkshire pork, those sorts of named British breeds are now being called upon. Again, it's great they're all still around. So large-scale food, large food production is still incredibly important. 
uh, as well as niche markets. So Gloucester cattle produce single Gloucester cheese that can only be produced from Gloucester cattle in Gloucestershire, a wonderful niche market where you can have value. But we've got to feed a growing world population that's now at 9 billion. There will always be starving people in the world and there will always be obese people in the world. But there's a huge amount of mouths that need feeding responsibly and carefully. And that is many of the uh, responsibilities of people in this room who will be doing that in the future if they're not already doing it. And so Dad ended up with about 50 different breeds of seven different species. And his business partner here, John Neve, the guy with the glasses, turned to him and said, Joe, lovely collection, beautiful hobby, um, but they're costing us a fortune. They're not commercially viable, they're not making any money, all these rare breeds, what are we going to do? So Dad said, well, we'll diversify. We'll open our gates to the public. We'll, we'll showcase rare breed conservation and tell everybody about food and farming. And we'll call it the Cotswold Farm Park. His partner supported him, and, um, but lots of, again, his farming mates thought he was nuts. Diversification, what's this? Why would you want to do that? What's wrong with straight agriculture? Welcoming people onto your farms? Why on earth would you want to have people tromping all over the land and getting in the way and making a mess? The villagers petitioned against it. They didn't want tourists in the Cotswolds blocking up the roads. Back then, in the late 60s, it was a way through to get to the coast. Now, uh, they, they forged ahead, went, there was an old barn on the farm, a bit of land that was hand, hand quarried, and opened the Cotswold Farm Park in 1971, the first ever open farm park in the country, if not in the world. There's now about 1,200, I believe, 40 years old. 55% of farmers have got a second job. We've all diversified. In fact, the government have given us grants and incentivized us to, to diversify into holiday lets, B and B, equine centres, caravan sites, you name it. We're all diversifying. And that entrepreneurial, sort of innovative spirit in the, in the modern day farmer is absolutely essential if you can't manage to turn the business over and, and make enough profit um, to, from straight agriculture. So messaging is absolutely key. I mentioned getting young people into agriculture and, and exciting opportunities there are out there. I wish that I was back at Agricultural College or University again now, and if I was going to go to one, I'd want to be here. It, it, incredibly exciting the times ahead of you. And what agriculture needs is um, to think about it as a whole food supply chain. We were talking about this at lunch. That if your dream is to own a 500 acre farm and you don't come from a family background who have got a farm or are tenants, that is likely to remain a dream as the price of land just escalates and is now around £10,000 an acre. But if you ask any student or school student you know, what they're interested in, you can slot them into that agricultural food supply chain somewhere whether that's in nano-engineering, marketing, packaging, agricultural banking, agricultural law, health and safety, or milking cows, shearing sheep, or driving tractors. You know, there's something for absolutely everybody. And a lot of those jobs are incredibly rewarding. But the agricultural colleges and universities are full again. So there's going to be quite a lot of competition. And the industry is an incredibly, in an in incredibly privileged position now, because it can cherry pick the very best and you will also be competing with people from outside the industry who've got other skills who can offer to the agricultural industry. So really important now that everyone works incredibly hard and goes away from places like this with the amazing knowledge that you are picking up. And you can do your bit to talk about it.